So that was bad. Hey, what is up guys? I hope y'all are having a great evening or morning or afternoon. Spending it well, I hope, not on Netflix trash, which is what I just did. So I thought I'd shake things up a bit. I do have another video essay in the works, but as part of my research for that one, I found myself watching the Netflix original movie, Sierra Burgess is a Loser. And I have a lot of thoughts about this one. So I just thought it'd be fun to do a casual little review where I just word vomit it all out. And hey, I haven't had a negative ranty review yet about a specific TV show or movie, so I guess this could be the first of many. And yes, I know, very timely, I am proud to be the very first person to cover this movie. Look, I know I'm late to the party, but hey, better late than never. So as you probably already guessed, this was a disappointing movie. And not in a technical way, per se. It isn't shot bad, and the acting's alright. It's just that the message was pretty questionable and heavy-handed putting it nicely. It stars Shannon Purser, also known as Barb from Stranger Things, Justice for Barb, and I don't know if that had any influence on why the music in this movie sounds kind of futuristic throughout. I mean, there was also this scene. Take your jaw off the floor, Mouth Breather. My room's upstairs. So I don't know, maybe they were paying homage. This movie definitely wasn't justice for Barb, though. Sad to say. But anyway, we follow Purser, who plays our titular character Sierra Burgess, and off the bat, the film's very blatant exposition tells us that she's not like the other girls, because she's really smart and doesn't care for vanity. You have toothpaste on your face. No, 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 okay. Well, won't you sell more books if you have the one teenager who doesn't obsess over looks? We're then introduced to arguably the best characters in this movie, her best friend Dan, played by RJ Seiler, and leader of the Gen Z Plastics, Veronica, who at first comes off as your stereotypical stock mean girl. Like, the first thing she does after Sierra pins up an ad for her tutoring services is rip off the entire bottom half where her phone numbers were. She's almost like cartoonishly villainous. But we soon learn that this does play a very pivotal moment later on in the movie. Anyway, it's English class, and we learn that the students are required to write deep and meaningful lyrical poetry, so slam poetry, as their newest assignment. Being the daughter of a famous writer, the teacher expects Sierra's work to outshine everyone else. Then we get this really awkwardly written confrontation scene between Sierra and Veronica. Veronica in the bathroom. So Veronica insults her, calls her Frodo, and pushes her aside, to which Sierra responds with, Frodo is from Lord of the Rings. You're thinking of Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame? He's ridiculed for his appearance and represents a stratified class, not unlike the structure of her own high school popularity. Man, who wrote this? Like, that kind of made me cringe, because I feel like in real life, she'd be bullied even more for that comeback. Like, she definitely would be making the popular girls laugh in the background. But I just love how the music just swells with this dramatic effect. Like, she just slapped her with the sickest bird in teen movie history. Shortly after that, we're back with the plastics. And what do you know, it's none other than Noah Centineo. This guy is like the Molly Ringwald of Netflix teen films. And honestly, I get the appeal. I've seen To All the Boys I Love before, it was cute, I guess. But he does generally come off as a really likable dude. I have to say, though, this kind of came off a little bit forced. Hi. I'm I mean, uh, hey. Jamie. So, unsurprisingly, Noah, who plays random hot boy Jamie, sees Veronica and instantly wants her number, and she wastes no time giving it to him, but plot twist! With the help of Chekhov's tutoring ad from the earlier scenes, she tricks him with Sierra's number, and here, the main story takes place. Sierra gets a text message from Jamie later that night, but instead of letting the poor guy know that, hey, I'm actually not the glamorous cheerleader that you met at the diner. Instead of saying that, she just rolls with it. And okay, at this point, I can see how this could make for an entertaining comedy of errors. Usually when done well, the character is painted as reprehensible and creepy, and you're not meant to root for them. However, this movie does want you to root for our protagonist, painting her actions as more romantic rather than, you know, Gross. We soon find out that Veronica was dumped by her college student boyfriend for not being smart enough, and in an effort to fully commit to this twisted long con, Sierra offers to tutor Veronica so that she could get the guy back, God knows why, in exchange for Veronica to help her catfish 
Jamie. And man, these guys really go for it. They don't pull any punches. Veronica gives Sierra selfies to use in her text conversations with Jamie. She even fakes a video chat where Veronica lip syncs to the responses Sierra gives on the other side of the screen. And admittedly, the idea is kind of clever. They use the excuse of a laggy internet connection so that Veronica could mouth the words right after Sierra says them. But clever scam tactics aside, I can't help but seriously feel bad for this guy. This is some criminal shit. <laughs> Pounding. My heart's pounding. Oh, man, f off. All right, so this is all very cringe, but I do have to say my expectations for Veronica were actually pleasantly subverted. Her arc was probably my favorite part of the film, because you know, as these two just innocently go about conning the poor man's ass, they do actually form a genuine, unexpected friendship with each other. And I thought that was nice. You barely get to see that with the typical mean girl in these movies. We get to learn more about Veronica and her troubled past and why she acts out in the way that she does. Turns out she's suffering from abandonment issues with her dad leaving the family and has to suffer the overbearing, unreachable, superficial standards her wannabe stage mom sets for her. Not that it was cool that they took time to dig into her backstory. You know, like I said, these mean girls typically tend to just be straight up villains throughout these movies. Like, usually there's no other dimension to her. So I thought this was a cool plot line, but of course, we can't have good things for too long in this movie, so back to our oh-so-romantic love story. Fast forward to another ordinary day at school, and look at that! Sierra, while hanging out with Dan, sees Jamie in the wild, playing catch with his brother. In an effort to mess with her, Dan runs straight over to Jamie and asks if he and Sierra could join. And then this happens. And you are. She pretends to be deaf. Oh, but joke's on her, cause turns out Jamie's little brother, plot twist, is actually deaf and she accidentally introduces herself as shit pizza. Still, she continues to carry on with the fake deaf act, and I mean really this girl is all kinds of messed up, yet we're still led to believe that this is some romantic meet cute moment. Also, while editing this, I noticed I forgot to mention this awkward lingering moment they had for some reason. Like, why are you giving her that look? You've literally never met her before. If you heard her voice, I'd get it, but it's not like you recognize the touch of her hands. Why are you smiling so hard? You, you call that a success? We had a moment. Did you though? So after that whole disaster, the two just bounce. Like he asked to be part of their game literally a few seconds ago. That's the whole reason why they introduced themselves in the first place. Now they're just leaving. Ah, but here it is, the cherry on top of all the creepy shit they've been doing so far. You think it can get any worse? Jamie decides that, hey, maybe it's time I meet Veronica in person. Yeah, good idea, buddy. So of course this freaks Sierra out and you think this would have been the moment she'd fold. You think that this would have been the moment she would have had the balls to tell the truth. Yeah, no, she literally gets Veronica to take Jamie out on a date while she creepily shadows the two. Ah, yes. Modern romance. Anyway, the date ends and Jamie and Veronica end up hanging out at a car park. We get all these really fun, charming exchanges. Them from down here and they look so beautiful and shiny. They're actually just made up of hydrogen, which means that they're just massive balls of gas floating through space. I mean, I think it's trippy. Change of perspective, you know? I wonder if the star knows that it shines. Shines. Is this poor guy. Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? <sighs> Stupid question. So fucking awkward. Like, if I were Jamie, I would just bail. This chick is not interested. Anyway, the two end up having a little moment. He goes in for it, fails the first time because Veronica freaks out, but she convinces him to close his eyes and wait a while while she gets ready. And by that, she means dragging out Sierra, who was watching them from under a car this whole time, very normal, and have her kiss Jamie instead. I just realized that Netflix categorized this as swoon-worthy, right? Veronica, I just want to see you. You see me now. <laughs> you said you wanted to see me, and now you're not even looking at me. Well, yeah, but I thought I thought I like saw. What so you saw? What? Sexual assault. That's that's what I saw. 
Can you imagine if the rules were reversed? Just like how nice guy TMs have been rightfully criticized, picked apart in recent years for normalizing manipulative entitled behavior in movies, nice girls like these shouldn't get a pass. Like I can just imagine the impressionable young teens who see this creepy shit romanticized. Anyway, the insanity is about to come to an end. Veronica invites Sierra to this random house party, gets shunned by her clique for hanging out with a quote-unquote reject, and ends up reuniting with her douche ex-boyfriend who takes selfies of them while they make out in the car. She gets dumped by him soon after. The whole thing comes back into play, don't worry. The next day, Sierra and Jamie's school are competing with each other in a football game. And he and Veronica bump into each other. Uh-oh. They have little awkward small talk once again, and he leans in for a kiss. In true teen drama fashion, Sierra witnesses this before Veronica has any time to pull away. Of course, instead of doing the right thing and talking to Veronica, I mean, how crazy would that be? She hacks into Veronica's Instagram account and sends those scandalous selfies of her and her ex on Instagram with the caption dumped over a DM. And I just want to say, I don't know if it's just my high school experience, but do people really give a shit about this? I just kind of feel like in reality, people would see this sort of thing and like ignore it. Like they'd feel bad and embarrassed for her, sure, but it honestly wouldn't be like that big of a deal. But of course, in this movie's universe, some guy actually takes the liberty of putting it up on a huge screen for all to see. Look, I get this movie's just some cliche, cheesy high school flick, but I also feel like it's trying really hard to relate to its target audience. I mean, it's attempt to pick apart social media culture, body positivity, all that jazz, so when outlandish, unrealistic shit like this happens, I can't help but get a little distracted. Of course, Jamie sees this and loses focus, and Sierra strides right over to him when that happens, and it's like, what are you doing? Are you gonna confess to him? Right here? In the middle of the game? But anyway, Veronica follows suit, and the obligatory best friend fight ensues, and I honestly kind of zoned out while all this drama was happening until Veronica spat out what was probably one of the best lines of the entire movie. You think I'm mean? You should check the mirror because your looks are the least ugly thing about you. Of course, she goes home and blames her bad behavior, once again, on how she looks. Actually, no, she blames her parents, to be exact. Do you have any idea what it's like to be a teenage girl and to look like this? Of course not, because you're tiny. You're tiny and you're beautiful, and you've always been beautiful. And this is what you stuck me with. The movie has these subtle recurring attempts of removing her of all responsibility. Like she had no other choice but to do these terrible things because of her insecurities. Do they justify them? No, the reason why people are mad at you isn't because you're quote unquote average looking, it's because you're not a good person. Anyway, for her English project, she ends up writing an original song, which she also sent to Veronica and was meant to be this poetic apology. I mean, actually not really, because she kind of uses her insecurities again to justify the stuff she did. It was a nice twist though, because you would have thought that she would have written it for Jamie, so I'll give them points for that. And for me, the one way this movie could have been decent was if, yeah, Veronica and Sierra reconciled, but she doesn't get the guy. Because let's be honest here, she absolutely does not deserve the guy. Am I right, movie? You are exactly my type. Oh, yeah, of course. And there you have it, Nice Girl TM the Movie. It was a waste of two hours of my life, but I do admit it made for some fun content, at least. I hope. Also, what is up with the 90s ass ending? As skewed as the morals in this movie was, I do have to give it credit for some things. Like I said, I do like how they subverted the mean girl trope and actually gave her a substantial arc in the film. I actually really like the portrayal of Sierra and Veronica's friendship. It was actually really heartwarming to see them form this unlikely bond. I loved RJ Siler. I kind of feel like he was a soft stand-in for the viewer because he literally spends the entirety of the film calling Sierra out on her bullshit and telling her, hey, how about you don't be such a creepy bitch? But on the insane planet, texting somebody that doesn't even know who you are? There's a word for that. It's called catfishing, and I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Law is woefully behind technology, so I don't know if that's true. He's also probably the best actor in the movie. If you guys are actually after a quality teen film, at least in my opinion, I recommend 2015's Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, which also features him and better writing. Once again, Centineo plays actual nice guy down to a T, but, and not to excuse the horrible stuff that Veronica and Sierra did to the guy, 
kinda came off a little dense. Like, sure, ignore the fact that Veronica and Sierra sound like two completely different people. After four hours on the phone, I can pick your voice out of a lineup. Press X to doubt. Could he not hear the sounds of two people moving around in front of him? I guess Veronica's just that hot that he won't question it. And I've established this, but man, after finding out that these two have been dicking around with my emotions for the past few weeks, I would not want anything to do with them. It is a wonder he even listened to Veronica at the end of the movie, much less took her advice to go after Sierra. And I gotta say it, Sierra's dad? Very annoying. He's meant to be this famous writer, and I guess the film really wanted to hammer that point home, cause he spends his entire role quoting lines from famous authors. Dreams are the bright creatures of poem and legend who sport on earth in the night season and melt away in the first beam of the sun. Family likeness has often a deep sadness in it. Nature, that great tragic dramatist, knits us together by bone and muscle and divides us by the subtler web of our brains. Where you been, kid wonder? Tutoring. A bad student and an even worse person. Mm. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with. And then the different branches of arithmetic. Ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. Yeah, not pretentious at all. The ironic thing is we never actually get to hear any of his own work. And finally, and I know this comes down to personal opinion, but I honestly don't think Sierra looks that bad. Like, admittedly, she is average looking by conventional beauty standards, but I felt like the film was just really trying to play up how ugly she is, and I just... I mean, they even attempted that vague comparison with Quasimodo, and I mean, like, are we looking at the same person? I get what the movie was trying to go for. I saw a ton of IMDb reviews about how this movie was meant to resonate with those who weren't conventionally pretty back in high school. And honestly, that would have been great if the movie wasn't so overshadowed by awful character writing. If we were meant to believe Sierra deserved her happy ending, they shouldn't have made her this entitled, unpleasant person who can't seem to take any responsibility for her unpleasant actions. But it's Instead, the movie rewards her for all that, so yay. And no, the fact that this was apparently based off of a play doesn't invalidate the criticism. Like, I also saw a bunch of reviews mentioning that, like, oh, you're just ignorant because you didn't know this was based off of a play. Like, we're not talking about the play, we're talking about this arguably very weak adaptation. In short, Sierra Burgess is a loser. That about wraps this video up. I'll see you guys with a new essay video in due time. If you guys are a fan of pop culture commentaries or reviews like this one, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't yet. Also let me know if you guys like this bad movie breakdown format. It was actually really fun, not gonna lie. Anyway, wishing you guys all an awesome holiday season. Don't catfish people and I'll catch you guys in the next one.